Hello everyone and welcome back to Asian Agash's channel dedicated to Age of Sigma and in this video we're going to be returning back to the Gloom Spy Git looking at the Moon Clan and in particular their heroes. So firstly I'm going to start with the what I like to call the shamans, the sort of wizards of their heroes. So we're going to start with the Mad Cap Shaman. So he's going to cost you 80 points. He is a leader and his description is a madcap shaman as a single model armed with a moon staff. So looking at his um, wheel stats, he's got a five inch movement, a six plus save, four bravery and four wounds. So looking at that, bravery, not the best, but I can be worse in this army. Um, a six plus save, at least he's got a save at this point. And four wounds, like I say, it could be less. Um, so yeah, it's okay, isn't it? I mean, this guy's costing 80 points and he's a wizard. You can't really ask for too much at all for that sort of point cost. And then looking at his um, mini weapon, so he's got the moon staff, which is two inch range, one attack, force to hit, force wound, mass one rend, and D3 damage. So that is sort of like a standard wizard attack. Usually it would wound on a three instead of a four. However, like I say, this guy's costing you 80 points. He's got an attack that does a D3 damage opposed to one that I could have easily seen him only doing one damage. Okay, so and then looking at his abilities, so we have got the uh, Mad Cap and Mushroom. So, once for battle in your hero phase, you can attempt to cast one additional spell with this model. If you do so, and the casting roll is a double, this model suffers D3 mortal wounds after the effects of the spell, if any, have been resolved. Okay, so first of this, it means if you try and cast, you know, that extra spell. You could roll a double and you could get a double one as an example and then not cast it, but you're still going to take D3 more wins, that's like the worst case scenario. However, the good thing about it is if you did cast that spell and the enemy have not managed to unbind it, you're still going to get the effects of the spell off, um, even if the mortal wounds were to kill this guy, because like I say, he's only got four wounds. So yeah, that just makes him a better wizard, doesn't it? And for an 80 point wizard, basically what you're looking for in this, it's not exactly when you look at models that are quite a lot in points where you think like, oh, what is making them worth the amount of points? With this, it's the case of like, what are they missing? You know, they're still good for that point, and so far this guy is. Okay, and so um, his only other ability is magic. So it says this model is a wizard, it can attempt to cast one spell in your hero phase and attempt to unbind one spell in the enemy hero phase. It knows the Arcane Bolt, Mystic Shield and Night Shroud spells. Okay, so we know what Arcane Bolt and Mystic Shield does, so let's look at Night Shroud. So, Night Shroud has a casting value of 5, it successfully casts pick one friendly unit wholly within 12 inches of the caster that is visible to them. Until your next hero phase, subtract one from hit rolls for attacks made with missile weapons that target that unit. Okay, so that is useful because essentially, you know, most of your saves in this army aren't that good. You know, like a 6 plus save is quite common, so making the enemy harder to be able to shoot your models of the board, if it be a big block of... Um, you know, stab or something like that, or you've got a hero, would it say he's on a, um, a Manga Squig? And I know obviously if he was a Manga Squig, he'd have a better save than a 6 plus. However, he wouldn't be getting that lookout Cyril. But with this, he now would be effectively. So, yeah, I think it is a good spell, especially like for 80 points. And even if you just take this guy, just for doing your Arcane Bolt and Mystic Shield or your Realm spells, he's really, really good for those 80 points. Um, I can't really fault him too much. Uh, most wizards that cost 80 points are quite hard to fault. So, yeah, I do like this guy. And then looking at his keywords, he's got Destruction, Grot, Gloom Spike, Git, a Moon Clan, Hero, Wizard, and Mad Cap Shaman. Okay, so now that we've looked at basically the generic, you know, um, sort of wizard shaman for your uh, Gloom Spikes, let's have a look at the uh, one that's a bit of a step. I want to say step up is because it's the main character one, you know, the one that came from... Uh, malign portents which is going to be the fungoid cave shaman okay so the fungoid cave shaman is a leader and he's going to cost you 90 points so 10 points more than the um, normal madcap um, shaman that we've just looked at so what are you going to get for the extra 10 points let's have a look so it's this description a fungoid cave shaman is a single model armed with a, a moon sickle so looking at his wheel stats he's got a 5 inch movement a 6 plus save bravery 4 and four wounds, so exactly the same wheel stats we saw for the other guy. Uh, looking at his melee weapon, so he's got two. So he's got his moon sickle, which is a one inch range, three attacks, force hit, force wound, minus one round, one damage. And then the spore squeaks vicious teeth, so one inch range, two attacks, force hit, force wound, no round, and one damage. So a better like melee weapon, a better combat effectiveness for this guy than the other one, but that's not what you're looking for the shaman for. 
But I suppose if he gets stuck in combat somehow and the enemy don't attack him, he's got a chance of killing one or two like one wound models. But that's not what this guy is known for. Okay, so then uh, going into his abilities, so he's talking to us about the companion, which is the Bongoid Cave Shaman. He's accompanied by a spore squig that attacks with its ferocious teeth. For rule purposes, this is treated in the same manner as a mount. Okay, so then looking at the rest of the abilities, so we've got the mouthpiece of Mork, which is if this model is on the battlefield at the start of your hero phase, roll a dice and a 4 plus, you receive an extra command point. That's really good, especially how there's quite a few ways in the Gloom Spike gets to get those command points. It can be really, really useful. So yeah, I'll just in a 4 plus, and the enemy probably aren't going to target him with too much stuff because he's not too much of a threat. Uh, presumably, so yeah, that's nice, that's good. And doesn't have to be a general either, it's just if he's on the board on the four up, you get it. And then the next one is Death Cap Mushroom. So, once per battle, this model can attempt to cast one extra spell in your hero phase, and that's it. So, there's no uh, negative effect like we saw with the normal shaman, where it's like, or if you roll a double for that cast effect, you're gonna take d3 more wins. No, this guy just does it. Um, it's once per battle, yeah, but that's like one more. Once per battle, you can do like another spell from the law, you know, from the Gloom Spites, or you can do um, like a Realm of Spells, something like that, or if you need to do a Endless Spell, it's really useful just being able to pull out that one extra spell. Okay, and then the next one, it says Spore Squig. So roll a dice each time you allocate a wound or mortal wound to this model on a 4 plus, and that wound or mortal wound is negated. Again, that is pretty good. That's, well, a wound he's got. So he's going to save against half of all the damage he takes now he's only got four wounds but still it's going to make him a lot more survivable so yeah that's nice as well and then looking at the magic says this model is a wizard who can come to cast one spell in your hero phase attempt to unbind one spell in the enemy hero phase it knows the arcane bolt mystic shield and spore more spells so looking at spore more so spore more has to cast a of seven he successfully cast each enemy unit within d6 of the caster suffers d3 mortal wounds um i don't like this one at all because you just have to get really close to the enemy and you don't want to get this guy close so I mean if the enemy comes to him and he happens to be in range of the enemy and the enemy aren't really attacking him great you've got a chance of doing d3 more wins to the enemy but the range in that could only be a one inch because it's d6 yeah don't like that spell however there are better spells than that to take um in the, the battle tone for the Gloom Spike gets and it's also realm spells as well isn't there so don't pay too much attention to that or you can just do a mystic shield arcing bolt so yes, um, don't pay too much attention to that. But that's like a basically when he's sort of fucked and he's about to die, he can do it. Basically, way to go out and glory, I suppose you call for the goblins. Um, but yes, I do think this guy for the extra ten points, he's worth it because he can do that one extra spell without any next effects, giving you a chance of getting command points. He saves half all the damage he takes because of the spore squig. So yes, this guy is better than the normal Madcap Shaman for the extra 10 points. Of course, if you've, um, you know, you really try to squeeze everything in the list and you just don't have that extra 10 points, then yeah, the Madcap Shaman is good. But if you've got the extra 10 points, the Fungal Cave Shaman, in my honest opinion, I believe is better. And then looking at his keywords, he's got Destruction, Grot, and Gloom Spike, Gits, a Moon Clan, Hero, Wizard, and then Fungoid Cave Shaman. So yeah, better than I, th I thought it would be, because I remember looking at him when he first came out and I thought he is just what is the point but now he's got a few more abilities because he's got the command trait generating ability now and um and because of the realm spells and stuff i think yeah this guy has definitely got a more purpose now so yeah i do like him for 90 points really good um so yeah i'm a fan of that wouldn't be nice if he had five wins but you know you can't ask for too much can you so yes so then we're going to move on to uh, the uh, lunar bosses after um reviewing those shamans and i know we've got the other shaman who's going to be the um Strike out the Loon King, but we're going to get to that, you know, at the end, save him for a bit of a treat. So, in the meantime, though, let's get started with the uh, Loon bosses. And obviously, we're going to start with the small one and make our way up. So, we're going to start with the one that's got the helmet shaped as a yellow moon. I think you guys probably know who I'm talking about. So, this guy is obviously a leader and he's only going to cost you 70 points. Only 70 points for this hero. So, at that point, again, it's like when we looked at the shamans that are really cheap. It's a case of, you know, how bad is this guy not a case of how good is this guy it's how bad is he and if there's anything particularly good about it then it's a welcome surprise because of how cheap he is in points so it's a description a loon boss is a single model armed with a moon slicer so looking at his wheel slash got five inch movement a five plus save a bravery five and five wins 
yep, a 5 plus save is good, especially if he only is costing you 70 points, so yep, that's good. Um, going into his melee weapons, he only has 1, and that's the Moon Slicer, and that's 1 range, 3 attacks, 3 hit, freeze wind, martial rend, and D3 damage. Not a bad tax at all, you know, I could easily see this damage just being 1, because of how cheap he is. And then going into his abilities, he has got, the first one is Dead Trixie, so subtract 1 from hit rolls for attacks that target this model. Okay, and that doesn't say in the shooting phase or in the combat phase, so that means that any hit rolls that target this model, you subtract one from them, or the enemy subtracts one from them. So, that's pretty devastating, especially how this, he could team up with the lookout serval, so he make the enemy minus two to hit him from shooting, and it's just pretty survivable, again, for how cheap he is. Then this, so there's already what I was saying how cheap this hero is, and this, that, and the other, but I haven't really seen anything yet that we lends himself to your army. Why do you put him in the army? So let's have a look at the command ability to see if there is a reason there, as that is his last ability. And it is, I am the boss, and now stab him good. So you can use his command ability at the start of a combat phase. If you do so, pick one friendly moon clan grot unit wholly within 12 inches of a model with this command ability, or wholly within 24 inches of a model with this command ability. That is your general. If the unmodified wound roll for an attack made by that unit in that phase of the six, that attack inflicts one mortal wound on the target in addition to any normal damage. The same unit cannot be picked to be affected by this command ability more than once per phase. Okay, that's a very nice command ability. I don't know if it's the best one in here. However, it's very good if you've got those extra command points, you know, you can spend, and we've already talked about quite a few ways for the, uh, you know, Gloom Spite and the Moon Clan Grots in particular to get those extra command points. So it's definitely, you should have one free to do something like this. On a, obviously, putting it on something like, you know, a, um, well, looking at your Grot units, I'd probably say put it on the, a big unit of big stabbers, probably give you the most, best opportunity to get out those more wound inputs. And especially how that is, um, if, you know, a modified wound roll of a six inflicts one mortal wound on the target. But the most important thing here, it is in addition to any normal damage. So the normal damage will still go through as well if the enemy fails to save, which means if you swamp something like a Star Drake or something like that with a big unit of stabbers, and you think, well, they're not going to be great against Star Drake because how good of its save is, you might do enough more wounds. So maybe not kill it but to damage it so much that it's really regretted um, getting to a fight with you and it's definitely underestimated your stabbers. Okay, so looking at his keywords, he's got Destruction, Grot, a Gloom Spike Git, a Moon Clan, Hero, and a Loom Boss. So we're going to now look at the uh, Loom Boss. He's still going to be unmounted. I think, you know, we'll, we'll stick with the unmounted theme for the moment. Now, of course, is going to be the Loom Boss with Gigantic Cave Squig, which is the um, Scarsnick model from the world of old if you are familiar with that and essentially he is going to be better than the other loom boss I looked at because he's going to cost you a hundred points so it's 30 points more than the last one so let's see what you get of course you're going to get a big squig let's see what you really get so looking at his description of course this guy's a leader um, a loom boss with a giant K squig is a single model armed with a moon prodder and then it's a companion so a loom boss with a giant K squig is accompanied by a giant K squig funny enough that attacks with its massive fanged field gob. For rules purposes, it is treated in the same manner as a mount. Okay, so looking at this wheel stat, she's got a 5 inch movement, a 5 plus save, 5 bravery, and 6 wounds. So the only difference between him and the last one is he's got an extra wound, which I imagine is represented by the massive fucking squiggies right next to him. So yeah, that, that's right. I mean, like, 4 plus save would have been nice. Um. But, you know, let's see what his um, abilities and uh, weapons are like first. So, his first weapon is going to be his missile weapon. And this is going to be the Moon Prodder. So, it's got a 14 inch range, D6 attacks, force to hit, freeze to wound, minus one rend, and one damage. And then, his melee weapons, we've got a Moon Prodder. So, this is 2 inch range, 4 attacks, force to hit, freeze to wound, minus one rend, and one damage. And then, last but not least, the massive fanged field gob from the squig. It's got a 1 inch range, 4 attacks, 4 to hit, freeze wound, minus 1 rend, and D3 damage. It's nice to see D3 damage there, because squigs all used to have D3 damage attacks, um, but they got rid of it because they sort of 
uplifted everything else about them. So it's still nice to see that this guy is still doing D3 uh, damage with his attacks. So looking at them all, uh, the moon fodder, that's good. I mean, 14 inch range sounds short, but it could be shorter. Like anything, it can't it. So 14 inch range is too bad. Um, D6 attacks, lovely, with a minus one render, and not too bad to wound the hit characteristic at all. And then melee weapons, um, well, it's obviously the squig is going to be doing the most output because it's got four attacks here with minus one render to it and a D3 damage at the end of it. So, yep, yeah, very nice, very respectful. And then his prodder, um, you know what, I was looking at it and thinking, well, it's not as good as this missile one, but actually, no, it is, it's better, isn't it? Because it's a stand of four attacks rather than the risky sort of D6, isn't it? So, yes, not bad attacks all overall for the extra 30 points. Okay, and then going into the abilities, we have got uh, the first one, which is Dead Trixie, which is the last one, which is subtract one from hit rolls for attacks that target this model. And the reason why I say it's the last one is because it's the one we've just reviewed. Okay, so the next ability... This is last one, and this is going to be a command ability. So it is, I'm the boss now. Stab him, good. So, looking at it, um, quick read it. It's exactly the same as the last one we looked at for the loom boss without the um, giant case quick. Would have been cool if it was different. However, it's a loom boss, isn't it? So, sort of makes sense. Would be nice if they gave as many command abilities as possible, squeeze them in there. But nonetheless, it is not. But it is still a good command ability for the reasons I've already mentioned. Okay, and then looking at the keywords, he's got destruction, grot, gloom spike, gits, moon clan, hero, and a loom boss. Now let's look at their mounted variations. So the first one we're going to look at is the loom boss on giant cave squig. So this is going to cost you 110 points, the most expensive one we've seen so far for the loom bosses. 10 points more than the one with the giant cave squig, and a solid 40 points more than just the moon boss on foot. So what are you essentially going to get? So you're going to get a mount on you, you're going to get the squig. And of course this guy's a leader, so let's have a look at his description. So it says a loom boss on giant cave squig with a single model, armed with a moon cutter or a moon clan stabber. So the mount it says, so this models a giant cave squig, attacks with its massive fanged field gob, and it says it can fly this model as well. Okay, so let's have a look at the wheel stats. So movement 2d6, save 4+, plus, bravery 6, Wound 6. I really like that save of 4+. Plus. I think that's absolutely awesome. That's brilliant. Um, bravery could be worse than that. Wounds, it's nice to see that it is 6 to be represented by the cavalry element to it. Uh, movement 2d6. Absolutely all hell. Don't know. That that could be good for you. Could be really bad, isn't it? It's really risky. But, you know, it's this army, it can be competitive. All those sorts of things can do really well. It's been proven that it can be done well. But I think most people play this army for fun, aren't they? For randomness. You know, like, it's it's exciting rolling to see how far it moves, isn't it? Two, six. You can make it move 12, you can make it move 2. You know, excitement's in the dice, isn't it? So, yeah, I haven't got a problem with that. Okay, and then looking at his melee weapons, so they are free. However, you only get two of them. Because basically, the weapon which the goblin is holding on top on his back of the uh, squig um, can only be a cutter or a stabber, not both. So, we will have a look at the Moon Cutter first. So this is a 1 inch range, 5 attacks, 3 to hit, 4 to wound, no rend and 1 damage. And then the Moon Clan Stabber, it's got a 2 inch range, 5 attacks, 4 to hit, 3 to wound, no rend and 1 damage. And then the last meter weapon is the Massive Fanged Field Gob, which you're always going to get with this War Scroll. So, that has a 1 inch range, 4 attacks, 4 to hit, 3 to wound, Minus one rend, D3 damage. That is, well, the damage output, isn't it, for this guy. And um, I would definitely go for the Moon Cutter. Or, actually, thinking about it, the reason I said the Moon Cutter is because, you know, opposed to hitting on fours, which would have been for the Stabber. However, the Stabber wounds on freeze. It sort of just like works in reverse. I think it's better to have a easier to hit than to have a easier to wound, on most cases. Um, but it's a five attack weapon, isn't it? So... It's alright, could, it could kill one or two uh, wound, wound things in the game, I think, for um, for sure. Okay, and then his abilities. So he has got the red cap and mushroom. So a grot that eats a red cap and mushroom turns into a crazed killer. So once per battle in your hero phase, you can say that this model is eating a red cap mushroom. If you do so, you can reroll all failed hit rolls and wound rolls for this model until your next hero phase. 
Okay, so there's once per battle ability, so you can only do it once in the whole game. It has to be activated in your hero phase. However, it's an extra ability, isn't it? Gets you those uh, re-rolls to um, hit and to wound, which is good because it's also not re-rolls of one. It's also just all failed um, hit or to wound rolls. And also, you're making five attacks at weapon. Yeah, I know it doesn't have any rend like I've already talked about. It's only one damage, but it's quite a lot of attacks. So, yes, it's an extra ability. Why not? And then the last ability is the command ability, and this is let's get a bounce in. So you can use this command ability at the start of your movement phase. If you do so, pick one friendly model with this command ability. All friendly squig units holding within 12 inches of this model at the start of that hero phase can move an extra three inches. If they make a move in that phase, a unit cannot benefit from this command ability more than once per movement phase. Okay, so I think this really sort of ties in why you would take the Loom Boss on Giant K Squig. It's because he is designed to be taken in the Squig army. His command ability obviously is not going to be so good if you don't really have any sort of Squigs in your army. But it would affect um, him as far as I'm working. He is a Squig um, unit, but he only moves 2d6 anyway, so it's, it's quite random. I think there's better command abilities out there if I'm honest. Um, but he has got the keywords, so he's got Destruction, Squig, a Gloom Spite. Moon Clan, Hero and Loom Boss. So if I was to say who's better out of all the Loom Bosses, which isn't a monster or you know the, the named one, which we'll um, get to on the end, I would probably say the Loom Boss with Gigantic Cave Squig, personally. Uh, he's only 100 points, he's 10 points cheaper than the one on the Cave Squig. Um, I just think he's more reliable and overall will be um, more effective. Okay, so that is then going to bring us to our next one, and this is going to be the Loon Boss on a Mangler Squig. Okay, so he is a leader and a behemoth, and he's going to cost you 300 points for one model, as obviously, you know, he's a leader, so there's only going to be one model. Now, he's obviously quite a bit expensive than the other Loon Bosses we looked at, mainly because he costs nearly three times the amount of any of them. So let's see what this guy can do. So the Loom Boss and Magnus Squig, so the description of this model. A Loom Boss and Magnus Squig is a single model armed with a Moon Cutter. And it says mount. This model's Magnus Squig attacks with its huge fang filled gobs and balls and chains. Then it says crew. This model's Mangler crew have a grot crew that attack with their bastion sticks. For all purposes, the crew are treated in the same manner as a mount. And the reason why it specifically says that is because you know how command traits and artifacts, they benefit the um, uh, bearer of those artifacts, but they don't benefit the mount. It's now just clarifying what is the mount and what is the bearer. The bearer is literally the guy riding it in control, not the grots hanging off the edge like with their little stabbers. And they're, well, they're stabbers, what are they? They're called um, bashing and sticks. How could I get that wrong? Anyway, it also says it can fly because it, you know, it goes bounce, 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 bounce. Don't see anything wrong with that. It's bouncing, it can fly. Okay, so then going into its wall stats, its movement is 3d6. So, yep, 3d6. Of course, with this um, Magnus Squig, I've already reviewed the Magnus Squig in the um, Squig video I did for the Gloon Spites. However, I didn't review the one with the Hero, and I just reviewed the generic one. So, obviously, the Squig uh, stats are going to probably be the same, if not very similar. Okay, so its movement is 3d6. Random as all hell. Um, but it's on a damage table, so it will get weaker. However... It gets weaker when it gets to 5 to 7 wounds, it's the weakest it gets, and then it gets better and better until it gets to how good it was on 4 wounds. That's a really interesting thing about the Magnus Squig, it makes them a lot of fun. Okay, it's got a save of 4+, plus and bravery 10 and 12 wounds, a good save of 4+. Plus. I know a lot of people are like, well 4+, plus, you know, doesn't make him that survivable, 3+. Plus. There's plenty of monsters out there that have a 5 plus save, but for a monster that costs 300 points, it should be a 4+, plus, and it is. Bravery 10, absolutely fantastic. That's You're not going to find anything in this army that has a better Bravery than Bravery 10, you know, for its own stat off its War Scroll. So that is fantastic. And then going into the melee weapons, it's actually got a lot. So it's going to have four. The first one is going to be the Moon Cutter. And this is a range one, five attacks, freeze to hit, force of wound, no render one damage. So nothing to write home about. Not bad to hit and to win characteristics. It's very similar to what we see in the cutters for some of the other um, loom bosses as well. Okay, then we're moving to something a bit more exciting, which is the huge fanged field gobs, which is obviously from the Mangler Squigs. So it's got a 2 inch range, 4 attacks, 
hits on a free, but it will get again, like I said before, the more damage this guy takes, it will hit. It will get harder to hit essentially, like all monsters, because it's got a damage table. But when it gets to the end of its life, it actually hits a better and as good as it did at the start. Like I said, interesting little guy. Okay, so and then it wounds on a free, minus one rend, and d6 damage. So I'll say it again. So it's got two inch range, four attacks. Starts to hit some freeze, wounds and freeze, minus one rend, d6 damage. So this is one of the typical sort of dragon sort of attacks that they fight with them more. And the reason why I say I put it in the bracket is because it's d6 damage. It's very random. You it could be amazing. It could knock a unit out of the park. It could also be very disappointing. But that's part of the fun, isn't it? It's all the randomness rather than it just being like a flat free damage. So yeah, that's good. Uh, the next one, balls of change, got a two inch range. It starts with seven attacks, and again, it gets weaker and gets better again, according to the damage table. Um, it's got freeze to hit, freeze to wound, minus two rend, and d3 damage. I think this is actually probably better than the um, huge fang gobs. And, well, I say that, to be honest, huge fang gobs are probably better. However, the balls and change, seven attacks, minus two rend, d3 damage is more reliable, I'd say, for its damage output. Okay, and then it's got the grots of bash and sticks. So this is one inch range, four attacks, fours and fours. No render one damage. That's really good. I expect that to be fives and fives. So fours and fours. Yep, that's very nice. Okay, and then we're going to go into the abilities. So the first one is Kasplat. So add one to the hit rolls for attacks and made with this. Models are balls and change if the model made a charge move in the same turn. Yeah, that's not... Well, your movement's very random, isn't it? If you get your good movement roll, then you're obviously going to... Good chance of making the charge, aren't you? But... It's not too bad actually. So what? What's the average of um, 3d6? I think I think I talked about this before. I think what the bad average on a 3d6 is is it 10, isn't it? So if you look at this model, like on average moves 10, that's not a bad movement, is it? So you've got a good chance of getting the charge. Um, and then the next bit is red cap mushroom. So we've looked at this uh, before with the um, other loom boss on the squig, but we'll read it again just in case it's different. Once per battle in your hero phase, you can see that this model is eating a red cap mushroom. If you do so until your next hero phase, you can re-roll hit rolls and wound rolls for this model, but not for the model's mount or crew. So yes, it's the same as the one in the last one. It's not going to affect the squig or the crew, um, sadly, but it's an extra ability. Why not? Okay, and then the next one is a watch out. And this says, if this model is slain before the model is removed from play, roll a dice for each unit within six inches of this model. On a 4+, plus, and that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. Okay, most importantly thing here, each unit. So not each enemy unit, just each unit. So it will affect you as well. Just bear that in mind. You maybe not want to have this guy surrounded um, with your own friendly stuff. But yeah, he goes out on a bang, doesn't he? So yes, that is very good. Imagine it just goes wild and bounces around and just crashes into everything. So yeah, that's cool. And then the command ability is Bite the Bad Moon. So you can use this command ability at the start of your combat phase. If you do so, pick one friendly model with this command ability in that combat phase, and you can add a one to wound rolls for friendly squig units while they are wholly within eight inches of that model. Okay, so again, if you're taking a very squig centered army, this is going to be good for you. If you've got an extra command point knocking around, you haven't really got a squig center army, it's also going to benefit your loom boss as well on the mangler squig because he is a squig, isn't he? Uh, well, he's got the squig keyword, of course. So. And then he's adding one to wound rolls, so that's pretty good, isn't it? If you've got the extra command point, of course, you haven't really got anything else to spend it on, and you just want him to do more damage. Because if you do that, that means that all of his attacks are hitting at least a three, and at best a two, which is really nice. So, yeah, not a bad command ability. Of course, it depends how you build your army. Okay, so keywords, he's got the structure and squig, a gloom swipe, git, moon clown, monster, hero, and a loom boss. Okay, so with the loom boss, our Mangler Squig done, of course, it is going to leave us to our last hero we are going to review for the Moon Clan part. So the uh, Gloom Spike Git, and this is going to be Scratgrot, the Loom King. Apologies if I've pronounced this name wrong. I think I pronounced it right, but yeah, I wanted to leave him to the end because he's like the name character, isn't he, for your um, Gloom Spikes. So I know you've got like the other name characters from... Warhammer on the worlds, but they're not really up to the same standard as Scraggot the Loon King, are they? So he is unique, like I said. He is going to cost 220 points and he is a leader. 
So quite an expensive leader, but isn't mounted. Okay, so looking at his description, it says Scatrock the Loon King is a named character that is a single model. He is armed with the moon on a stick. Okay, so looking at his wheel stat, it says he's got a four inch movement, a five plus save, bravery six and six wounds. I would have liked him to have had a four plus save. Again, I'm reading through this the first time with you guys. So I don't know if um, he's got an ability down below that's going to help out his save. But if he doesn't, a five plus save, not found off, should have been a four plus, but I'm sure there'll be something in the ability to um, counteract. Uh, he's uh, not really good save there. Bravery six, low bravery, but better than most things in this book. And six wounds. Yeah, I'm happy he's got six wounds, not five. He really, I think he really needs that, doesn't he? Okay, so then looking at his weapons, he's got two. And they are both going to be the moon on a stick. But that comes as a missile weapon and a melee weapon. So he gets both of them. So let's see what it's like first as a missile weapon. So that moon on a stick. So 28 inch range, six attacks, freeze hit, freeze wound, miles from rend, one damage. That's a really, really, really good range for a fucking stick this guy's throwing. So yes, 28 range is really good. Uh, yeah, it's only one damage, but it's got rend to it. Really good to hit into wound caster. It's both being free and it's making six attacks. So you can look at that as it's one attack, hits on a free, wounds on a free, miles on rend, d6 damage. I think the average is, a, is about the same on that. Maybe worse. I don't, not really too sure. Not massively huge amounts of However, that is a really, really good range. Very, very nice attack that is. And then the moon on a stick in a medium form is a two inch range, four attacks, free to hit, free to wound, miles from rend, one damage. I would have maybe liked that to mean two damage because it's like in melee he's a bit better with it, you know, rather than just trying to lob it across the um, battlefield, but it's actually worse in uh, melee, but oh well. You know, look at it as it's a missile weapon that hasn't got a bad uh, melee uh, stats rate either. Okay, but where this guy, I imagine, really comes into it is going to be his abilities because he's got a few. So the first one is a babbling wand. So if this model is your general, and is on the battlefield at the start of your hero phase. Roll a dice on a four plus. You receive D3 extra command points. Okay, D3 extra command points, just like that. A lot of armies take it a battalion just to get an extra command point. But this guy's just getting D3 like that. Okay. And imagine you're also getting your additional one at the start of your hero phase as well. So you're getting that one and the D3. But you need to roll a four plus. So 50 50, but still, that is really, really good. Okay, then the next one is a moon on a stick. God, I've said that word. So, well, the collection of those words so many times. Okay, so if any wounds inflicted by the moon on a stick are allocated to an enemy model and are not negated, that enemy model suffers one mortal wound at the end of each battle round, even if the wounds inflicted by the moon on a stick are subsequently healed. Okay, so I was saying about a stick. So good range, good shooting attack, but in combat, not so good. How it? Wherever they attack are basically cursed, and they're always going to take a mortal wound. So at the end of each battle round, so that is quite a lot. If this guy gets into combat early games, let's say turn two, um, and he doesn't die, or even if he does die, still goes through, you can end up doing what, like three, four mortal wounds in that model. So yeah, that is good. I I do like that. Of course, it's not going to really mean anything. This guy's attacking one wing models, but if he's attacking heroes, all those sorts of things, or just like four wing models, it's going to be useful, isn't it? Okay, and then looking at the next ability is the Loon King's Crown. So add one to cast and binding rolls for this model. In addition, a roll of dice each time a wound or mortal wound is allocated to this model on a four plus, that wound or mortal wound is negated. Okay, yep, yeah, that's fine. That is better than having a four up save. That is a four up. Death save, so absolutely fantastic that it is a wound or mortal wound. So, yep, he's survivable. Okay, and then going into magic now. So this model is a wizard. It can attempt to cast two spells in your hero phase and attempt to unbind two spells in the enemy hero phase. It knows the arcane bolt, mystic shield, and nick it, nick it spell. So the nick it, nick it spell is nick it, nick it has a casting value of eight. If successfully cast, pick a one enemy model within eight inches of the caster that is visible to them. The unit model belongs to suffers D3 mortal wounds. In addition, if that model has an artifact of power and the cast and roll was a 10 plus, that model's artifact of power can no longer be used if it was used to enhance a weapon and that weapon averts to its normal form. Okay, so good way of neutering 
um, enemy artifacts. Of course, you need to get on a 10 plus, but this guy's adding one to his casting rolls, isn't he? So you could do it. Um, and then it's just a way for you to do more wins to the enemy as well. Um, casting, I have eight though. So because you're already going to cast on quite a high value anyway, I would just use this to target enemy artifact bearers. Um, probably wouldn't bother using it for much other things. I'd just use it just to target artifact bearers to try and um, neuter their artifacts. Because a lot of armies that depend on their artifacts for synergy purposes. There's also armies that try and use artifacts to make models into Death Stars and stuff. But a lot of um, well synergized armies will probably use artifacts for um, synergy purposes. Because if they let's say it's a, it's a ore effect they give up to the rest of their army, and it's something the enemy can't really stop without killing that guy, and that guy's a big monster. This guy could do it a lot easier way. So yes, that is an interesting spell. I do like it. And then it's command ability. So the Loon King's entity. So you can use this command ability once per battle if this model is your general and is on the battlefield. Before you roll, the dice to determine how far the bad moon moves that battle round, if you do so, you can choose for the bad moon to either not move that battle round or to make one move or two move that battle round. Do not roll the dice to determine how far it moves. Okay, so that is a good ability because obviously a lot of your army and quite a bit of its energy, not all of it, quite a bit of its energy depends on where the bad moon is and it's, it's a random effect, isn't it, in the bad moon? So if you can control it and enhance it and use its power to benefit your army and you can think turns ahead because you know that, you can plan and prepare better for it, it's going to benefit your army somewhat. I'm not going to say it's going to hugely benefit your army because I haven't played with these guys, so I'm not going to say, I'm not going to lie to you guys and say, oh, it's a massive. It probably is. I know there's some Gloom Spike players who are watching this, so let me know how massive it is to be able to choose where the bad moon goes, as it were, or sort of control it a bit rather than just being completely random. But I imagine it can uh, really help you guys out. Yes, this guy has to be the general to do it. However, this guy also has to be the general for you to get those extra command points. So, if you're taking this guy, he's going to be your general. Now, that means that you can't take the command trait, doesn't it? If this guy is your general, because he can't have a command trait because he's a unique character. He's a named character, you can't have it. So, you will be losing out on command trait, but it may be worth it. And I think this guy's going to be a lot of fun in the game as well, and play some sneaky tricks on your opponent as well. Okay, and then his keywords are destruction, and grot, and gloom spike, git, a moon clan, hero, a wizard, a loon boss, and scrag got. Okay, so. That is going to be the last hero for the Moon Clan I'm reviewing. And also, subsequently, it's going to be the last Moon Clan uh, unit war scroll to be reviewed as part of the Gloom Spike Git um, army video for their army archive. Now, I've been reviewing them for quite a long time now, but what we've got left is going to be the uh, Spider Fang Trogoffs. Not too sure what order I'm going to do them in yet. And then afterwards, at the end, it's going to be the Battalions. I spent a lot of time on the um, Gloom Spike Gits recently, and there's been a few things that happened, um, private life and work and all that, what means that I haven't been able to do as many videos lately. So it feels like I've spent a long time on the um, Gloom Spikes, probably, to be honest, a couple of months or something, I think, by now, probably of their videos. But um, i only got a few videos left. I'm going to enjoy doing the rest of the videos, don't get me wrong, but it would just be nice to move on to a different army um, after this. Something to note is that because, obviously, most of the armies I've reviewed so far, or half of them, haven't had battle tomes, so they're not too long. I think they're like four video armies because you've got like um, the law video and then like I think like three army videos, something like that. But obviously, when they've got a battle tome like this one, the fleshy course, the fleshy course bit of exception because I went on full detail of them, and the uh, night haunt, you realize actually just how many videos they sort of require and there's so much to talk about so maybe it's something i can look into the future to try and say make it more manageable just so we have a bit more variety on the channel or if you guys would like to um see a bit more variety because the impression i've got at the moment if i start a um, army series so the gloom spites i'd quite like i know there's a few interruptions with news and updates that come along but i would quite like to just do videos on that army until that army's done because in my mind, in my OCD mind, that sort of makes sense to me. And I think that's what you guys want. But I realise that some of you guys probably don't, like as an example, don't click Gloom Spite. So you're probably not really interested in the videos, which means you don't really see much content from me um, for a while that you're interested in. Um, which I don't want you guys to feel like that. I want everyone to um, enjoy the majority of the content I put out. So that's what I'm going to look at in the future. I'm probably going to do a little short 
channel update on that uh, soon, probably after the Gnutoi Git, just so I can have all your thoughts. If you guys are still listening to this at the end of the video, please let me know down below what you think about that. But anyway guys, so that has been the Moon Clan part of the Gloom Spike Git finished up in this hero video. So if you did like it, please like, subscribe and comment down below because it's absolutely free for you guys to do so and absolutely massively helps out the channel on YouTube. And if you'd like to support me a step further, like I said before, I've set up a um, Patreon account now and it's a great way for me to get um, support for the channel without me putting any stupid adverts and stuff on any of the videos and is a great way, like I say, for income for the channel because YouTube doesn't pay me anything like that. So um, it massively helps towards, I think just like generally my motivation putting like time to the channel, better times, um, saving up for things like a microphone, better one that I've got um, and camera stuff like that would be really, really cool. And on that note, I'd like to say a big thank you to Max, Carl, Simon and Martin for again, um, their continued support because they are vampires, which is like tier two on Patreon, which means they donate at least five dollars a month. Really, really does help guys. And like I say, all that money has been saved up for all those great things. And if you guys can't support me on Patreon, it's absolutely fine. I'm just really glad you came and checked out this video and hope you enjoyed it. So guys, remember, until next time, Nagash is all and all is one in the gash.